Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly round of all the latest Nikon news and all other photograph announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here. And this is Becky. Today is the announcement day. Today, Nikon finally announced this mysterious retro ZF camera. Hurrah! It's been a long time coming, I have to say, and we're very excited that it's here. We are looking forward to seeing this camera in the flesh, but until we do, here are the specifications, price, and where you should get it from. Hint, it's Grays of Westminster right now. All right, so let's start with the sensor. It's 24.5 megapixel sensor, basically very similar to the sensor on Z6 II. But it's not the same. It's not. And it is, just for clarity, a full frame sensor. So we got that, which is great. It does have an X Speed 7 processor. So, same processor as the Z8 and the Z9, which is very cool indeed. All up to date. Then we have minus 10 EV auto focus in low light. We also have largest auto area AF, which basically covers the whole sensor. And it is larger than the coverage on Z6 II and Z9 and Z8 cameras. We are now covering area of 89 by 96% versus 78 to 83% on Z8 and Z9 and 80 by 80% on Z6 II. Very exciting indeed. Now, the other new feature of this camera is the fact that it has a black and white switch. This means that you can go directly into monochrome mode with the flick of a button. Yeah, and that's pretty cool because now you have a video mode, you have your standard color mode and black and white. Now, black and white can be also set to two different modes. Your standard one, what they call it flat monochrome. And now we have this very high contrast monochrome, which they call deep tone. And imagine that would work very similar to black and white film with a red filter or so. So that, that will make your clouds to pop quite a bit more. Very high contrast. So great if you love shooting black and white. It's something that people used to talk about with uh, the DF back in the day. So really nice that they've added a switch to make it nice and easy to transition from color to black and white there. Now we also have our touch control screen and the top panel is actually made of brass. It does also have a little window to show you your F number on the top. It's slightly larger than on Nikon ZFC. It also feels more robust than Nikon ZFC. However, the flippy screen is basically the same on both cameras. Still a flippy screen. Exactly. Flippity doodah. Flippy, flippy, flipping <laughs> screen. Some other features include starlight view, backlit autofocus, and subject detection in manual focus. So yeah. if you have an AFD lens, the older AF style lenses with aperture rings, or even manual focus lenses with a chip on them, if you've done that yourself, talk to me about it later, um, so then you can get subject detection in manual focus, which just ups your game a little bit. Yeah, so imagine you doing a portrait and it's suddenly that your little square thingy is right on the eye if you have an eye detection. And if you assign 100% zoom to one of the buttons, let's say for me it would be okay, then you can quickly zoom in, make sure that the eyelashes and eyeball is sharp, and then go back and take shots. So that should improve your overall manual focusing quite a bit. So if you've got manual focus, make sure they're cheap, as Becky mentioned. So let's say recent Voigtlander lenses, mm -hmm. they're fully cheap. And if you've got a bunch of AFD lenses, while they want to focus, they have a chip on them, which is quite useful. Exactly. Now we've also got up to 14 frames per second in RAW. We do have 30 frames per second on this camera in JPEG only, but it's considerably fast. Bearing in mind that earlier iterations of our retro cameras were designed to take your time and slow down, and I think 14 or 30 frames per second is not too shabby at all. Now this camera actually also has pre-release capture mode, and that means that you can start taking the pictures before you've actually taken the pictures, up to one second before and four seconds after you've pressed the shutter release button. Yeah, so all those features will come with improved those focus speed. While they, it's not Z8 and Z9 performance, it's still better than Gen 2 versions of Z6 and Z7. As far as we know, and that's set to be determined once we get the camera in our hands. Now, the first in Nikon cameras, we now have pixel shift shooting. Probably not the camera that I want this to be implemented to, but effectively it's a newest feature and we expect it to be implemented in other cameras with a higher resolution sensors. But what it does is basically it will allow you to take several shots of the same subject, assuming the camera is on the tripod, you have options to shoot 4, 8, 16 or even 32 shots. It's take a high res shot using vibration reduction on the sensor, effectively moving the sensor around. Then you 
upload everything in the software, something like Nikon NX Studio, and it will actually create a one raw file out of it. So very high resolution file. If you are a studio photographer, if you are, let's say, still life photographer, or even landscape photographer and like to print large, then I guess that's one way to handle a 24.5 megapixel sensor. That's very true. Now, there are some other additional things that they've added. We've got portrait impression, we've got skin softening like we had on the Z8. We also have a new, for portrait photographers, rich tone portrait mode. What does rich tone portrait do? Well, effectively, they say it's speech control depicting skin details in rich tones, suppressing white clipping, retaining details in rich area. So I would call it a flat mode mm. for photography, Yeah. but that's basically creates a nice neutral file for you to be worked on in a post-processing software like Photoshop or whatever you use. Now, we were told that this will be added to the Z8 and Z9 in a future update. You've also got a magnesium alloy camera, so it is more sturdy. It is dust and drip resistant. And as we mentioned before, you've got a brass top plate there with all the lovely tactile knobs and dials too. Speaking of mechanical shutter, the lifetime of the shutter is approximately 200,000 cycles, which is very similar to Z6 II cameras. Exactly. Now for our videographers, there are some video improvements here in this camera. You can record up to 125 minutes of recording, even in 4K. So in full frame, we can record in 4K 30 frames per second, and it's 125 minutes, so effectively two hours or so. Now, it can also record in 4K 60 frames per second in DX mode. That's right. And in standard mode, it will only record up to 50 minutes, mm. and then you have a high temperature mode. Hot, hot. What we've noticed in the Z8 firmware update, that there was a new change to high temperature as well. So in the high temperature mode, it can record up to 125 minutes. Now, Nikon ZF, surprisingly, again, is like, it seems like a camera for videographers, which is surprising to have this retro format for this camera, but it is the first camera that have a shutter priority video yes. for Nikon. So effectively what they say is you set the aperture manually to whatever you want, and then you can set your ISO to auto as well as your aperture to auto. And that helps you maybe if you're shooting indoors and you need to set your aperture to artificial light sources so you won't get flicker, but also if you're shooting in rapidly changing lighting situations where you still want to keep your shot speed set, but you want your lighting to be balanced out a little bit. So again, we assume that this will be implemented into other Nikon cameras as well. We can hope. There are also audio improvements. So for those audiophiles who have perhaps not liked the previous audio capabilities on earlier cameras, we now have 24-bit linear PCM at 48 kilohertz. Fantastic. Now, in terms of storage, it takes two memory cards, one SD, one micro SD. It takes Intel 15 batteries, and it has a tiny little grid built into the camera, which should improve your handling on the go. Now, the price is... <laughs> and the sales start date is <laughs> so if you'd like to get yours pre-ordered then you can do that from Greater Westminster obviously if you're in the UK or Europe you can also pre-order from us if you're anywhere else in the world but you may want to order it from your local retailer instead and later today do join us for fuller coverage of this announcement in our Nikon report. It will be out later today. We will have all the discussions and thoughts on this release that we will share with you. Yes, we will. See you soon. And we are back. So now let's talk about this camera because it does feel a little bit like it's trying to be lots of different things for different people all in one body. Okay, let's start for straight from the beginning. So Nikon F was released in 1959. And then they released all other cameras after them. No, but let's look at it from this point of view. We had Nikon DF for the recent DSLRs. Really strange camera. It didn't fit any Nikon lineup. And a lot of people call it the Marmite camera, where it really aimed at the demographic who wanted to have their Nikon F3 in a digital form. But people who got used to more modern cameras, they couldn't get along with it. So we had this camera, right? And it was kind of aimed at this very niche. It was. It was a, as they called it, a pure photography camera. It didn't have video built in. It wasn't trying to do anything else except be a beautiful camera designed for stills. And a lot of people said, oh, well, they put the D4 sensor in there because they had surplus of them or whatever. I mean, yeah. whether that's true or not, but, it was a photography camera. But it's also made this camera amazing in low light. Yes. And that's what these photographers really appreciated. So they actually enjoyed that. And also a low resolution sensor for old lenses actually made sense because 
some of the old lenses, they just couldn't perform really well on 30 megapixel plus sensors. Very true. So assuming this is, was a very tailored and focused release for a very specific group of people, yeah? Then we have a Nikon ZFC. Which is for the influencers and the vloggers and the people that want to look cool. Yeah, so it's kind of was more aimed at the younger generation of people. I would say so. While still trying to capture the nostalgia of the old film camera. Yes. So we had people using those cameras. Even Richie was quite vocal about him using this camera as his kind of a non-professional camera. Mm -hmm. But obviously it was a DX sensor. And for a lot of us, we prefer full frame sensor, as simple as that. And it wasn't the answer. And we said, when is the full frame Nikon ZFC going to come out? And that's literally, we said it on day one. I remember saying this. So obviously it's nice to have a bunch of different leather coverings and all the different colors and things like this and skins. Nikon later released the black version of the camera and we had finally silver and black. But I would call it a less focused release, more kind of aimed at capturing a wider share of market more mm -hmm. than anything else and trying to grab some Fujifilm users as well because it was yes. a kind of competing with the XF series cameras. Now we have this camera as well, which is first of all, better built, more expensive. We have a full frame sensor. We have now slightly better improvement for manual focus lenses, especially if they're cheap ones, you'll mm -hmm. get this manual focus subject detect. Mm -hmm. We now have those features like black and white switch, which for me personally, this is an incredible thing to have. Really nice addition. As well as the deep tone monochrome as well. Yes. But at the same time, we have pre-capture, we have fast autofocus, we have high frame rate, we have video functionalities, all those things that let's say DF users won't really need. No, and we have pixel shift shooting, which is something that we didn't expect to see in this camera, but maybe in something else. So it is it is a quite a combination of cameras for a combination of users. So why do you think this mishmash of things, is there a reason for that? Is it just now we have to have everything in one box? Or do you think Nikon is having a different strategy towards marketing this product? Well, I think on this one, they're probably trying to definitely target a wider audience rather than just stills shooters or just hipsters. They're going, look, some professionals want a, a beautiful looking camera. They don't just want a tool that looks like everyone else's camera, they want something that's a little bit more unique and different. And perhaps they like the unique stylizing of the fact that you've got the knobs and dials on the top. I definitely think there are going to be people that will buy this camera that won't use all those additional features that have been introduced into them. I think that they would have spent their whatever it is, £2,000 or £2,200, mm -hmm. even if the camera didn't have those things in them, even if it had been less specced out that way, but had a slightly higher resolution than what it's been given. What I feel like we've been given is a slightly lower resolution camera, so 24.5 megapixels, which we've seen for a very long time. It's been, that figure's been around for a long time. And then they've added all these things to kind of pad it out to make it a more interesting camera to a wider variety of photographers. But they could have just as easily made it 36 megapixels and not put all that stuff in. Yeah, but we haven't seen 36 megapixel sensor in a while. And I think that's the reason I think- Bring it back. <laughs> Exactly. I think we are getting kind of over the shell sensor, which is slightly modified. So yeah. it seems like it's not the ZX2 sensor, it's a modified version of the same thing. Yes. My thoughts on this is yes, Nikon is trying to build a kind of a bridge Gen 2.5 camera, which sits on, let's say, you got Z6 II. Mm. It kind of appeals to people who want to upgrade it and get fast autofocus with a new camera, mm -hmm. but it's not Gen 3 generation, which should be even better. It kind of sits in between. But also, I think people who had a DF, and who are not going to use any of those features that we mentioned, they already bought this camera effect in their mind. Mm -hmm. So it's sold. But what Nikon is trying to do is to capture more audience around this camera, right, yeah. just to increase the numbers. Because again, at the end of the day, if you are designing a very tailored and focused camera like Nikon DF, your price probably would go up to something like three, three and a half. I mean, if you look at Leica M11 mm. or even Leica rangefinders, they start about seven and a half thousand pounds. Yes, you know? yeah. So there's a big jump. Yeah. in price because they sell less units. That's right. Obviously, there's a lot more goes into production and they may only function in Germany, yada, yada, yada. But at the same time, I feel like if Nikon includes all those features that are there, and of course, you don't need to use those features because all the other tailored features are there as well. Again, maybe people coming from ZFC, maybe again, younger generation who want to have a cool looking camera, but also have all the latest features. Mm. That is quite useful. But you did mention the 24.5 megapixel sensor, and you did mention that you would hope for something higher res. Tell me why. 
Um, just for the simple reason that we've got the Z6 and the Z6 II in that 24 megapixel space. Although I understand if you are using vintage lenses, you don't necessarily want a higher resolution sensor. There's a huge majority of people that do want a higher resolution sensor. I am a very happy Z6 owner, but there are times when I go, mm, 24 megapixels isn't quite enough for something I'm specifically doing. It doesn't give you quite enough cropping power or in terms of printing, it doesn't allow you to blow up quite as much as you would mm. if you had more resolution. And I just think it's a shame. I feel like it's a little bit of a missed opportunity to have had a higher resolution sensor in here, not necessarily to compete with the Z8, Z9, Z7 II space, but somewhere in between the two. I'm going to stop going on about 36 megapixels because apparently nobody wants those sensors anymore. No. But I do, <laughs> do think that it wouldn't have hurt. Do you know what I mean? Well, you know me, I'm a big advocate for 24 megapixel sensor. I've been saying that 24 megapixel is enough. As we say in UK, 20 is plenty. Of course not. I absolutely agree with you. I do share a lot of my thoughts on the ZA sensor for street photography on my Instagram account. So if you haven't followed me there and back it, definitely do that. But my thoughts that I shared on Instagram was that we use ZA to shoot some street life photography with 26 and 28. Yeah. And obviously Z8 is not a camera for street photography because it's quite large. Yes. But I did like those focus speed and I did like the cropping power because, well, I shoot a lot of 28. The images with 26, I found that I had to crop a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when you start to crop 24 megapixel sensor... It does fall apart a bit. It does fall apart because you do lose quite a bit. And ideally, we want to get everything perfect in the camera. That's totally fine. And we should improve our technique. But sometimes it is nice to crop certain things and still have the details. And that's where I personally think that, yes, like I would love to have a ZF mm -hmm. with a 45 megapixel sensor. We now have improved autofocus, you know, which is good. So, but yeah. While 24 is fantastic, we do see other manufacturers releasing a higher resolution sensor as well. So again, looking at the street photography camera like Leica's, they had a 40 megapixel camera as well. Now they have a 60 megapixel camera as well. So okay. who knows? I think it's a clever decision from Nikon because first of all, it probably would be one of the best sensors for low light. That's why it's worth having this 24 megapixel sensor. Yeah. And a lot of street shooters probably will agree that low light is nice to have on those cameras. And I think Nikon also kind of sets themselves up for two, three years down the road, releasing version two of the same camera. And I personally think that ZF is going to be incredibly popular among Nikon crowd and other brand users as well. So I think they kind of leave in themselves enough space for generation two camera. And that's what I personally would be looking forward to. This camera's only just come out and we're only doing generation. But we're on the internet. And that's why as soon as the thing is out, we're going to speculate about the next release. Excellent. Well, I think that other features that really excite me about this camera, depending on what type of photographer you are, if you are someone who would have bought the DF back in the day, or you had a DF, or you looked at it and thought, this is almost the perfect camera, but not quite for me. Whatever your reasoning was, I think things like the portrait impression, the, the kind of lean towards portraiture is really smart. I think the support for manual focus lenses that have a chip in them is also very, very clever. Um, I don't know if pre-release capture is going to be used by everyone, but I can see it being used in the street photography space quite a lot not just for sports and wildlife, but Could I think, if, think in the street photography space. I like the fact that they have added that black and white switch. I'm going to talk about that all day. I think that's a, a brilliant addition. And then the other thing that I like about it is that it has enough of the newer things in it to kind of show us where Nikon's going. Yeah, It shows us the direction they're going. We've now got a high efficiency image format. We've got these longer recording times in video mode. Nikon are obviously not letting video go in any of their cameras. Yeah. They're just going to keep improving and improving it. And I think that that is a, a really smart move. And the other things like starlight view and backlit autofocus yeah. and those little features that you don't know you need them until you see that they're in a camera and you go, yeah. actually, I could use that. Yeah, and it all comes as part of the package. We had the discussion, does Nikon create firmware for the cameras as separate groups for separate models and then they throw those features from one camera to another? Because something like Pixel Shift, I didn't expect to be included Nikon ZF as a, to be like a selling feature of Nikon ZF because I would assume it would come on cameras like Z9 and Z8, mm -hmm. you know, or Z7 Mark II, let's mm -hmm. say, you know. It's good to have it, but I almost feel like this camera is not the right camera for it. Oh so, God. but it's it's interesting approach. We have a lot of features thrown in there. 
Is it camera for you, Becky? Will you consider switching from your Nikon Z6 to Nikon ZF? I, I am very interested in this camera for sure. I think it is a big enough upgrade that I would certainly look at it. I am a happy camper in the Z6 camp. I do love it as a camera. I am after more resolution at some point, but it's definitely a camera that I'll consider because of all the other features that it has in it. And I could see myself using something like this probably more than I use my Z6 at present. Okay, Becky, so... You've got a Nikon Z6, mm -hmm. and assuming you don't have access to Nikon Z8, mm -hmm. so assuming Z6 is your only camera, it's got 24 megapixel sensor, would you consider updating to Nikon ZF that's got more features, mm. but the same resolution sensor? Tell me your thoughts. I think that for the user experience, actually, potentially yes, because you'll only take pictures of the camera that you actually enjoy using. And if the ZF with all its tactile knobs and dials and being able to adjust chest speed and things like that, kind of adds to the experience of using the camera, then you're not just looking at the resolution. Obviously, it would be nice to have more resolution, and we can talk about that for days and fine. But with the next P7 processor, we haven't yet had a 24 megapixel camera with a processor like that. So I'd be interested to know how that affects. Do you think it can run crisis on it? Probably. I think so. I'd be interested to see how that affects low light performance and just general image output and and what these extra features like portrait impression and rich tone portrait and also there's black and white modes, what the new processor does to contribute to that, if mm. anything. Yeah. And, and I would turn the question back to you because you also have a Z6 and mm -hmm. is this a camera that you would find interesting? Is this something that you'd consider upgrading? Well, as I mentioned before, I'm definitely will consider it. I want to hold it in my hands to make a final decision because the film for me is very important mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I do use Z6 for some street photography when I don't shoot on film and I have some manual focus lenses on it. Mm -hmm. So I don't really need a super fast autofocus, but I can see it becoming a nice travel camera mm -hmm. paired with a nice little lens. I also think that a part of 28 and 40 millimeter small lenses in a retro design or modern design, you can should really release more this type of lenses, maybe Great. smaller aperture, but primes, yeah. you know, just to fit this camera nicely. I definitely looking forward to putting my Voigtlander 40F mount lens on it and mm -hmm. shooting with it. I would say maybe low light performance, uh, maybe the feel of the camera. Overall, I do like the knobs and dials mm -hmm. more. Again, Again, I wouldn't consider it as a camera I would use for professional use, but it really depends on your style of photography, you know, yeah. because sometimes you shoot in the studio, you can get the latest fast camera, modern camera, get the autofocus speed, all the features you need. But sometimes you shoot wedding and you want to look the part. And then finally, you know, this kind of retro camera makes the subject in a busy, stressful day of wedding, you know, feel a little bit more comfortable and relaxed, you Very know. Very happy so, that it's a retro camera exactly. that they're being shot with. <laughs> so I personally will definitely consider it. Can't wait to try it in my hands. I personally think a part of hoping for the high resolution, so I think it takes a lot of boxes for a lot of people. And I want to hear from you, our viewers, what do you think? Are you excited about this release? Are you looking forward to testing it out? Have you pre-ordered one? Yes, some of you are waiting for Gen 3, we know. But today, let's talk about this camera and this release. Let's be in the moment. Exactly. We can speculate about the future releases on another podcast. Excellent. All right, let's move on to the rest of the show. Let's do it. Nikon are going to take part in 2023's Photopia show in Hamburg, which starts on September 21st. Oh, yeah, there's going to be a huge Alex section there as well. But let's talk Nikon. Apparently, you can find them in Hall 1 at the Nikon Trade Fest. That's right. They will be answering questions about Nikon. And there is a great lecture program with exciting travel and product presentations from their Nikon creators on the Nikon on stage as well so yeah check that out i assume nick and zf is going to be on the stand so if you are in germany and not far from hamburg i would definitely recommend to go there and tell us what you think about the camera because we can't go there we are too far away sadly so now next up some technical service advisory news for users of selected nikon binoculars it has come to their attention that the imitated leather attached to the surface of certain binoculars may have exceeded the standard value for the total concentration of phthalate something chemical that i cannot pronounce now nikon have suspended shipments of the binoculars that are affected and according to their assessment it doesn't pose any potential health risks but if you do have any of the units affected they will replace them for you. You can reach out to Nikon. It, regardless of the warranty period, they'll sort you out. Yeah, and the lugs are okay on those. Yes. 
All right, next one up. Nikon have started a female facets project specifically for women in photography. So apparently this project is specifically for women with which they want to shed special light on feminine facets of photography. So they say regardless of whether you are already a professional or like to take the step towards photography for the first time, they're going to offer every photographer many opportunities to develop further in the coming months. They want to accompany you on your photographic path, inspire you and answer questions you have always had about photography. So to do this, they're providing you with a strong Nikon photographer mentor set who invite you to exchange and learn ideas with photographic know-how. To find out more, there is a link in the description box for all you ladies out there. Third party news. Fringe released the Canon EF lens adapter to Nikon Z, and it's a version 2 with improved dodge focus, will support vibration reduction on the lenses, will give you full control over the lenses, and it costs $300. Great! For you Canon users, you can definitely upgrade and switch to a Nikon system. Next up, Mikey have created a drop-in filter mount adapter for their PL mount Cine lenses. So apparently all filters are cross-compatible with the Mikey adapters and Canon adapters, and they'll be available from the 20th of September for you. Yeah, so you can mount it on a Nikon Z camera, you got PL lens, adapter, you can put ND filters, you can put a clear filters in there, things like this, and then mount it on your Nikon camera and use it as a proper cinema camera. So 250 pounds for this, I guess for you cinematographer, it's pretty good. Could be useful. Exactly. And now onto a big one. Adobe released the new creative cloud features with all the AI stuff thrown in in there. So there's a, there was a big news for Adobe. They did a public announcement where they released their, an Adobe Firefly, which is the name for their artificial intelligence platform. And that's included a lot of features in the software like Premiere Pro and Photoshop. In Photoshop, we've now got Generative Feel and Generative Expanse. Now, for some of you who have subscribed, they also announced a new pricing update. They've increased in prices from 1st of November. Ooh. The good news is that the prices are not changing for students, teachers, and educational institutions, but also for Creative Cloud Photography Plan, which a lot of photographers use. That basically includes your Lightroom and your Photoshop. Mm -hmm. For the rest, you will get price increase in Europe, USA, and UK as well. Now, they also introduced this token feature. Mm -hmm. for their AI features. So effectively, if you use their AI features within the software, you'll get 100 tokens a month. And once you use them, you can buy more. So it's effectively like a microtransaction. But I think the idea behind it is when you use AI features mm -hmm. in a software, you actually don't, you don't use AI on your computer. You effectively rent in the server time to process those features for you. Interesting. So just keep that in mind. And obviously, for some of you who don't agree with Adobe subscription and it being evil corporation that just announced their highest ever quarterly results, definitely put your comments in the link below. Just let yourself free. Excellent. And if you want to hear us talk about AI and photography, we did a whole live stream on it on Friday uh, off the back of that. And that was quite a romp. Yeah, definitely check it out. Now on to reviews. First one up, we did a review of 180-600mm lens that just recently came out. Does it live up to the hype? That's the question we ask in that video. That's right, and you have to watch it to find out the answer. Yeah, and if you haven't pre-ordered your lens, you can order it from Grace, of course. Now, we also had Steve Perry who did autofocus tests of this lens, just compared it with other lenses as well. So, very interesting test, just came out, definitely check them out. And then we have 85mm 1.2 S lens tested by DxO Mark, which gave it the highest score for any lenses tested by them. So this is basically the highest ranking lens right now. It's pretty amazing, actually. I mean, what a great result. They basically said that they can't comment on autofocus because they don't test for that, but they do find the optical quality of the 85 1.2 outstanding. And they said, admittedly, while there's some lateral chromatic aberration in the outer field, it doesn't affect much, if at all, image sharpness. And with the auto correction enabled in camera, it's unlikely you'd notice it anyway. That's how good it is. Yeah, it's definitely worth the money, apparently. I'm still toying with the idea, definitely. Very definitely. Tempting. Just probably need to eat instant noodles for like a couple of months. A couple of years. Anyway, it, it, it is a beautiful lens. We can attest to that. And of course, it does come at a price. But if you are a portrait photographer, this is 
certainly one worth considering. Now, just to give you a comparison, the 1.2, 85 1.2 by Nikon is at the top of their ranking. Then you've got the Canon RF 135 1.8, Sigma 1.4, for Nikon F mount, mm. the Yongneo 85 1.8, and then the Nikon Z 85 1.8. I'm actually quite surprised uh, yeah. for Yongneo lens because I it's do. not a very expensive lens, but no. apparently it's very sharp. So really? if you're on the budget, definitely consider that. Yeah, so there's something to have a look at there. And if you're interested, we've included the link in the description box for you. All right, and for your weekend read and watch, we have another episode of Nikon Session Season 2, which is sports photography, and they have sports photography legends like David Ramos, Pauline Ballet, and Loris Griffiths talking to Rich himself. The man, the legend. So if you're interested in sports photography, definitely check it out. out. They talk about the ins and outs of sports photography, how to capture fast action shots, and what it's like to have a front row seat to the world's best athlete's performance. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast platform, could you do a little follow and a rating and maybe a review? That would be super helpful. Thanks. We love you. Yeah, don't be shy. We are on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Unlimited, as well as Spotify of the world. We also publish some pictures, you know, those little pics taken with cameras on Sometimes. social medias. Yes, we do on Instagram. So I'm at Rebecca underscore Danese. The shop is at Nick on at Gray's. And I'm Skonsin Kochkin. We will see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.